harvest of native goats. And um, I really want to just emphasize right now that there's a distinction in um, native and introduced goats and how they respond um, to hunting pressure and how they respond in their environments. So we're going to talk about native goats. Um, at the time, you know, it wasn't anyone's fault, but little was known about the ecology and biology of goats. There just wasn't a lot of research done on it. There was research done on other ungulates, and wildlife biologists at the time coming out of university were taught game management based on common ungulate species like white-tailed deer, bighorn sheep, elk, and they thought, eh, it's another ungulate. This is how we'll manage it. In fact, in the 1957 Fish and Game Report, um, this is an exact, a direct quote, increased harvest pressure should result in increased productivity of the herd. Um, and this is true for other ungulate species, but it's not true for mountain goats. Um, and we know that now, but they didn't know that then. So they felt that while we're harvesting hundreds of mountain goats out of Northwest Montana annually, they felt that more harvest pressure would produce more goats to harvest. They would increase the productivity. In addition to the lack of understanding um, concerning mountain goat ecology, biologists believe that due to the remoteness of mountain goats um, and mountain goat habitat, harvest would never significantly impact the population. But that began to change by the 60s. They were remote no longer. In the 60s, logging roads in Northwest Montana provided access for hunters. So we started seeing a, a, this remoteness disappear in mountain goat range. Um, Mountain goats were very susceptible to harvest. In 1960s, we started to see a decrease in mountain goat numbers, and there was concern by biologists at the time that this could be a problem due to these roads going in. And so they placed the first restrictions that we ever saw on mountain goat harvest in Northwest Montana in the West Thompson area in 1960. In 1964, we started to see dramatic declines in harvest rates and success rates. Um, and goats became scarce to absent in the whitefish range. In 1965, Unit 14, the Swan area at the time, um, began to limit permits. And they limited it because they felt that the large number of logging roads accessing both the east and west side of the Swan range was going to have detrimental impacts on the goat populations. And they were seeing declines. In 1972, all the areas in northwest Montana were restricted by permits. Unfortunately, it was too late for some herds. Some herds were already gone, or very small. In 1976, goats all but disappeared from the once productive Thompson Falls area. So Thompson Falls, who's ever seen a goat in Thompson Falls? I mean, most people don't know there used to be goats in Thompson Falls area. Um, there might be four or five. So this all happened in a very short time frame. <coughs> so in response, we started to see hunting restrictions and closures. In the late 70s, HD 121, which was around Thompson Falls, was shut down completely. And portions of HD 100 up in the cabinets were um, closed to hunting as well. And in 1980, we tried a restoration effort. Um, it's the first and only one that's been done in Northwest Montana. Um, and that, we brought seven goats in from Washington State, from Olympic National Park, and put them back into Drift Creek, which used to be a very productive goat area. Um, unfortunately, that restoration effort failed. Seven goats was not enough. I was kind of impressed when they said four goats will start a herd, but it doesn't necessarily start a herd in some situations. Um, in 1986, our current hunting districts were established that we have for goats in Northwest Montana, and we went to a fully permit-based system. And then, as biologists came and went, we started to reduce and reduce and reduce the number of permits available. So this is what it looked like. Um, this is the data to date. Of, we've got year along the x-axis along the bottom there, and number of goats harvested and hunters along the y-axis. So the gray shading is the number of hunters. And prior to 1960, and a little bit after 1960, we don't have a really good record of the number of hunters out there. Um, and we have a, you know, a pretty good record of the number of goats harvested, but that's still a little bit iffy. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so in the 1950s, most of the harvest that we saw in Northwest Montana was coming out of the south and middle forks of the Flathead River, at which time we were harvesting upward 
herds of close to 300 goats a year. Between 1960 and 1963, 215 goats annually were, you know, on average, were being harvested um, out of the South Fork and the Middle Fork. 36% um, of those were females. Remember how we talked about the importance of females for driving population numbers in goats. So there was a problem. Um, in addition to the harvest, we're also removing goats out of the area for transplant, right? We're taking, them out of, we're, we're taking large numbers of goats, and, and then poaching was suspected to be high in some areas. There was little enforcement and lots of access and lots of people accessing the area. In 1972, we went to the permit-based system. Um, so everything beyond that, our harvest was controlled by permits, but the number of permits that we were issuing was still high based on the number of goats that we were seeing. But since 2011, um, our current permit level was established. So we really haven't changed anything <coughs> since 2011. Um, we're issuing 23 permits total throughout North, Northwest Montana or administrative region one. Um, but it might be a little bit late, even though the number that we're issuing is very low. So estimating goat numbers has always been one of the most difficult things that wildlife biologists have to do. It's very challenging challenging to enumerate any wildlife species and populations. Um, we do it through aerial surveys. Aerial surveys are very expensive and we're flying in dangerous um, mountainous areas. And so inclement, area, inclement weather can end a survey or prohibit the survey being completed at all. Um, and I just want to point out that estimates for goats are just that, they're estimates. Um, we get a minimum count in some areas we have very good sightability. In general, goats are pretty, pretty observable. If you fly early in the morning um, or late in the evening, goats are at higher altitudes, um, and so they're easily visible. So there's a really good rate of observation for goats. Um, so it's hard to say, looking at historic data, what the quality of the data were, what the areas that they covered were. They weren't running track lines. You know, they didn't have GPSs like I do now. I can go look back and look at what I covered. I know exactly what I did. I know what the biologist before me did. I can look at his track lines. But like in the 50s and 60s, that's not possible. But based on the 1957, 1958 goat um, management report, the estimate was 350 mountain goats in the Swan, 20 in the North Fork, 315 in the Clark Fork. Remember, that's done. Um, 900 in Glacier, 100 in Corum area, 450 in Spotted Bear to Schaefer, and 250 in Big Bear. And that's probably a lot more goats than any of you guys have seen in the Bob to date. So, so what do we have left? Does this graph look totally confusing <laughs> and um, freak you out at the same time? Because <laughs> that's the effect it has on me. <laughs> um, what is this? In short, this is, um, this is a mess. Um, it's all the survey data I have for mountain goats by hunting districts. We have 11 hunting districts for mountain goats in the area. Um, since 1980. Um, and so all this data and all these lines, and I throw this up on here on purpose because this is the kind of thing I have to look at and try to figure out what's going on with goats. And all this data that you see here, this is the one point that I can hang my hat on. This is a survey that I did of Hunting District 141, which is located in the Middle Fork last year. And I feel pretty good about that number right there. And this is what it looks like. So this is what flying a goat survey looks like. So in six survey flights, um, and all these squiggly, the green squiggly, gut-wrenching, I didn't even puke, thank you, very much. <laughs> Thought about it a couple of times. All that area, um, I saw 51 goats, including 29 adults and 12 kids. And like I told you before, sightability for mountain goats is typically very high, <coughs> between 60 and 80%. So I covered a lot of ground, covered a lot of area. It's hard to see in this, but it's not just one pass. Usually I was covering areas that I felt were good mountain goat habitat, sometimes three or four times, um, going back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. So I spent all of our regional survey money on this one survey for goats, <laughs> and then some, because I told my boss I wasn't stopping until I was done. <laughs> and this is just one hunting district, and I have so much more to do. So, and it's time and money, 
and um, helicopter time. We have one helicopter that we move around the state. We've got two for the entire state. All the biologists want to fly and use it at the same time. We about get into fist fights and we hate each other during the survey periods. We're friends otherwise. But I'm usually the meanest, so I usually get what I want. <laughs> so based on all the survey data, that big mess that I threw up there, and what the most recent surveys for the different hunting districts, and these are the hunting districts that we have in Northwest Montana in Region 1. These are all native goat herds. Um, I have to come up with best case estimates for goat numbers for all of these and figure out how to manage goats. So here's what we got. For uh, HU 100 in the, yeah, um, in the cabinets, um, I figured that there, there was a relatively complete survey done, I think in 2013. I couldn't get the date from the biologist in that area. Um, and we estimate about 100 goats in that area. Um, in, HD 100, an incomplete survey showed 25 goats last year. 16 to 18 goats in 131, that was a relatively complete survey back in 2011. In 2005, we did an incomplete survey of HD 132. We saw 24 goats. I don't even know what to say about this one, HD 133 in 2004. Um, HD 140, this was a pretty good complete survey done in 2013, not too old. We estimate about 60 to 70 goats in that area. Um, and this is the one that I can hang my hat on, 141, where I estimate about 58 to 65 goats. And that's from last year's survey. Um, this one's pretty good too, 2015, so it's getting kind of old. Um, then we've got some more incomplete surveys here down in the heart of the bob, 150. And then 151, where in 2008 they saw 16 goats. I know there's more than 16 goats down there, but I really couldn't tell you what. Um, so these are the data that we're kind of working with. A lot of them are old, a lot of them are incomplete. And we have a need to figure out what's going on with goats. Oops, one more <laughs> of unknown quality. Um, so unfortunately, we learned the hard way that mountain goats aren't like other ungulates. Um, Biological and social characteristics make them very susceptible to overharvest. So there's probably no question in my mind that we overharvested mountain goats, and in some areas that we're continuing to overharvest mountain goats. Um, the slow recovery of lack thereof is also a function of their ecology and biology. Recruitment is typically limited by the late age of reproduction. So as we talked about before, females don't give birth until they're really old <laughs> compared to other ungulates. Um, and there's high frequencies of reproductive pauses, so they don't produce every year either. Survival of two and three year old goats is really low. Um, it's lower than most ungulates, so that really has a direct impact on what we're recruiting into the um, reproducing part of the population. <coughs> and females have high site fidelity and low dispersal, so if they find a good area, they don't like to move from it. They don't want to disperse. So when you knock herds out of good areas, you might not see herds moving back into those areas for a very long time. And we have little uh, evidence of density dependence in native herds. So hunting is additive. And what that means is that um, typically in most wildlife populations, we talk about a harvestable surplus. And there's a total overall mortality that um, populations can withstand whether that's coming from natural mortality or harvest mortality, hunting mortality. And the idea is that if we hunt a portion of that mortality, then the natural mortality will decrease and the overall mortality will stay the same. And that's true for most wildlife. It's not true for mountain goats. It's additive. Um, so the amount of natural mortality is very low. What we take from hunting adds on to that mortality. And, and if we take adult females from the population, it's a bigger bang for your buck if you want to talk about reducing numbers. So speaking of females, um, we know that um, females are a significant contributor to the population, and especially these females that are 8 to 12 years old. Um, so harvesting adult females can really drive a population down. So this is what we looked at. This is our graph that we saw before with total harvest, but instead of hunters, in the gray shaded area, I've put out the number of females that were harvested, the adult females. So you can see that we were taking a large proportion and still continue to harvest female, female mountain goats. The trouble with um, 
trying to restrict people from hunting mountain goats, female mountain goats, is that you would create a regulation that sets people up to fail. Because identifying mountain goat females versus males in the field can be difficult for some people. And so you tell people to go out there and you can only take a billy, um, you, the chances are they're not going to be able to necessarily tell the difference and there's a really high chance of taking a nanny. So we don't typically create regulations that set people up to fail. Um, but we encourage people not to take females. Um, and as you can see, this is the age structure of the harvested mountain goats um, since the top is 2005 through 2009 and 2010 through 2015. And I don't have a pointer. <laughs> But uh, you can see the majority of the mountain goats that we're harvesting are from these older age classes. Uh, they're not yearlings, they're not two-year-olds. And, and that's because nobody wants to go out and shoot a little baby mountain goat. You know, Nobody wants to harvest that, that's not what they're looking for. Um, but if you're talking about sustainable harvest and what portion of the harvest, what portion of the population would actually be more sustainable to harvest, it's really those that have a higher mortality rate. So it's the kids and the yearlings, the two-year-olds, that you would encourage people to hunt and more sustainable rate. But that's not the case, and that's not realistic. Um, but as you can see, we are taking these older age nannies. Um, so I mentioned that dispersal is very limited, and, um, and goats, so, sorry. Another factor which influences why goats haven't recovered is that herds function as a meta population with limited dispersal. And what that means is we have a bunch of herds scattered across the landscape in these isolated little habitat patches. And that forms our larger population. Um, <clears throat> but because the females have very high site, fide high site um, fidelity and don't move around much, um, when you access those areas and you remove individuals from that herd, dispersal doesn't necessarily allow for repopulation of areas. Um, and suitable habitat for mountain goats is obviously very discontinuous. Rocky cliff here, rocky cliff over there. And getting from rocky cliff A, where now there is no mountain goats, you know, from rocky cliff B, you have to go through a sea of predators as well. When they're up on these cliff faces, predation is very low. So dispersal has its risks. Um, all of these factors make bringing mountain goat populations back very difficult in native herds. So what does our harvest look like? Um, hello? <laughs> Sorry, somebody's phone's ringing. <laughs> um, um, what does our harvest look like? So this is the harvest, the distribution of the mountain goat harvest in, in the region for the last 10 years. And as you can see, it's very clustered. And this has always been a big conundrum that I've had in Alaska and I had here. And you look at like, okay, we don't delineate our hunting districts based on biology or ecology of the animals. It's usually they're administrative and they're based on um, areas that we can delineate through either mountain ridges or river bottoms, but they may not be very related to the biology of the species in question. And so with mountain goats, it's super tricky because what defines a population um, is very hard to identify. It's probably not arbitrary administrative boundaries. And we know that when we look at mountain goat harvest, the best way to do it is to distribute it so that you're not impacting certain herds to a heavy degree. Um, and so what we see is that we see these clusterings and that's most likely larger groups and groups that are more accessible. In the um, left-hand picture, all of the darker yellowy tan coloration and shading, that's historic mountain goat distribution based on um, 1950s distribution data. And you can see there's areas that we don't seem to be hunting goats out of anymore. Um, but unfortunately, we don't know if there's still goats in the, a lot of these areas because we don't have the survey information to show. But chances are that there are goats that are areas that are absent of goats at this time. Okay, so um, what is a sustainable harvest? That's what everybody wants to know, you know. Well, how many goats can we take? Because we don't want to cause population decline. So what is sustainable? Um, and with mountain goats, it's really tough because there's been very few long-term studies on mountain goats that have looked at vital rates with marked individuals to really get at sustainable harvest. Um, but there was an effort put forth um, from long-term monitoring in Alberta um, 
And Hamill et al. looked at um, mountain goat harvest in, I think, 12 mountain goat herds and modeled harvest rates to see what, what were viable populations and what were sustainable rates. Because they had seen a decrease in mountain goat numbers dramatically with a harvest of 3% of the estimated population. And typically, as wildlife biologists, we say sustainable harvest rate for mountain goats is anywhere between 3 and 5%. But we're now finding that that may be too high in some native herds, not necessarily the introduced herds. We can talk about introduced herds later, but it's like a whole other talk. <laughs> um, but so what, what Hamill et al. found was that if you have a population of less than 25 goats, then your population without hunting is essentially going to drift towards extinction within 40 years. Because production and recruitment is so variable and so low that at that low number, they don't necessarily replace themselves. If you have 50 goats, your sustainable goat, uh, harvest rate is at one goat every 20 years. If you have 75 goats, your sustainable rate is one goat every two years. I'm getting better. If you have 100 goats, you can harvest 1% of the population annually. So one goat annually, right? Um, and if you have over 100 goats, you can maintain that 1% harvest rate, and you're not going to see a decline, and you can see an increase in your goat numbers. Oops. Um, so, but let me just point out that goat populations, their vital rates, these sustainable rates are based on vital rates, like how much are they producing, what's lambda, what's the, what's the growth rate for these populations, and what can we take. And with goats, it's really variable. Um, it's, it's variable between among native populations, it's variable between native and introduced populations, and so without site-specific population information on vital rates, it's really hard to ascertain what a sustainable har harvest rate is for a goat population. However, when we talk about this variation, it's very small. It's not like, oh, you can take one, goat, one population at 1%, but this one with a native population at 10%. It's more like, yeah, you can give it a 1% versus 3%. So we're talking percentage points here. It's, it's really small. So, for um, academic sake, this is the number, ignore that HD142, that's a, I made a mistake. <laughs> um, these are the numbers of permits that we issue currently for each of these hunting districts in Northwest Montana. Okay? So we don't issue very many permits for each hunting district. Um, and again, this, I'm just going to throw this up here. Here's the survey data that we have for these areas. We already went through all this and how good we felt about it. But if we look at this information and we apply the harvest rate that Hamill et al. came up with based on their population modeling of these 12 goat herds in Alberta, this is what we're looking at. Um, based on these current information, we're seeing uh, we should decrease the number of permits in 100. We shouldn't be hunting in 101. We shouldn't be hunting in 131. We need more data for 132. We should decrease the number of permits in 133. We need more data in 134. Decrease in 140. We shouldn't hunt 141. Possibly could hunt 142. We might be at the right level there. Um, more data is needed for 150 and 151. So there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, and, and like I said, we don't know anything about vital rates for these populations, uh, these herds. So, there's a lot of unknowns, but the, all the evidence is pointing towards we're probably harvesting most of these hunting districts at a rate that is too high to sustain or, or promote growth for these populations. So are you guys thoroughly depressed now? <laughs> so now what? What does this mean? <laughs> so what do we do? And I, I was like thinking about this presentation, and I was like, where do I go from here? And I think about mountain goats a lot. And, and I was flipping through the internet looking for pictures, and I saw this, and I was like, yes, that's kind of exactly how I feel right now. No, what is this? And what, what do we do? So can we restore mountain goats? Um, or are we going to lose mountain goats, these native herds in northwest Montana? Um, and I'm not talking about the park. <laughs> um, so what do we do? Do we reduce or eliminate hunting? One thing I do know is we need more current survey data. Um, or does the absence of the current survey data warrant closure at this time or reduction at this time? 
because should we err on the side of caution? We already know what we've done. Um, do we restructure our hunting districts based on current distribution? That's probably a good idea, but what is our current distribution? We don't know unless we do more surveys. We need data on vital rates. We need data on dispersal. Um, we need to know how these remaining herds function. What is our metapopulation? How can we distribute our harvest so that it's not harming it? Um, you know, and then we always look towards reintroduction. The transplant program was very successful. <clears throat> introduced bad goat herds everywhere we've introduced them where they didn't exist before. They're doing awesome to the point where they're considered vermin and, com and competing with other ungulate species, you know, um, in some areas of North America. So, I mean, in Kodiak, they can't kill enough of them. I mean, they're just spreading, 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 and they're destroying everything in their way. So, is reintroduction an option? Would that actually help our herds? And then, but then, where do we put them? Do we put them in areas where we think goats used to be, and it looks like good goat habitat now, um, or do we put them in areas where we know that are goats? Back in the 40s, when they started all these transplant efforts, um, the one thing that they really didn't consider at the time was disease transmission. And now we know from bighorn that disease is a big deal. And mountain goats do carry some diseases that we're concerned about. Is there a disease risk? The goats and the crazies. You look at where are the goat numbers really high, where could we bring them in from? The crazies is kind of one of the you know, go-to places. We, we could take them out of the crazies, bring them back here. They came from here. They went to the crazies. But what did they, they pick up in the crazies? Do we want to bring it back here? We don't know. We need to take a look at that before we would want to move any goats. Um, and one of the big questions that um, will be difficult to answer, but is the habitat capacity changed? Do we have a different level of habitat or availability um, based on conifer encroachment? We know that conifers have encroached into the alpine areas. Does that hurt mountain goats? Or does that help mountain goats? In some areas, the winter habitat is conifers. You know, so we don't really know without looking at that. And then um, the loss of summer snowpack. Up in these cirque basins, where winter, the summer snowpack would stay and recede slowly throughout the summer, providing high quality green vegetation surrounding as the snowpack receded. Um, that provided great habitat. Remember we talked about mountain goats have to get fat. They've got to get, have good food through the summer to get fat so they can use their reserves through the winter. But we've seen a recession of these snowpacks. Um, they just don't persist like they used to. So does that change how many goats we can keep in the area? Or the goat survival, that survival rate might just be lower in general because of that. So there's all these questions that we really need to look at before we can look towards restoring and what the best way to restore mountain goats are in, um, in this area. And so in general, typically when I end a, a presentation, I, I ask people if they want to have questions, but instead I just threw like 80 questions at you. <laughs> so, so get on it, answer it. <laughs> I'll, I'll be taking a list. <laughs> um, but seriously, that, um, I hope you're not all depressed. I mean, we still have mountain goats. And I think the really cool thing that we have is that we have the native herds. We have the source of all the herds throughout not only this state, but other states. Um, and you do have a dedicated group of biologists and, and people that um, care about the mountain goats and care about conserving these native herds. And we're, we're working to make sure that we have them in the future. So, But if you have any questions, I can answer them before I collapse. <laughs> politics that prevents us from turning off hunting. And I don't think there is any right now at this point. Um, so, um, well, I mean, what, what are you people in your organization facing if you can't turn it off? No, and I'm not saying we can't. Um, so what I'm saying is I just spent a huge effort, everybody new to this position, going through all the data, trying to take a look at where we are with our mountain goats. And my recommendation at this point is we're going to reduce these numbers. We're going to reduce our permits down to limited. Next year, we go through a season setting process. And at that time, we're going to recommend closing down most of these hunts or some of these hunts. Will you succeed? 
it will be up to the commission. So um, I, I don't think that there's a lot of pushback that I've heard. Um, but as a biologist and, and my boss, we've been looking at these numbers. And, but the steps that we have to take to get to the season setting process, what we can do now is reduce what we have. And then next year we'll be able to look at how can we change this. Mm -hmm. Is there any data showing um, how many um, actual kills there are from the number of permits that are Yes, so the question is, are there, what's the harvest from the number of permits that are issued? And so that was the data that I put up there where I had the number of hunters and then the number of mount, uh, mountain lions, mountain goats <laughs> killed. Um, and so in general, we don't have, we issue 23 permits for the entire region. You know, that's distributed amongst the different hunting districts. Typically, you, there's one to two permits per hunting district, except in 100, where that's at six currently. Um, and so the success rate for mountain goat hunting is very high. People that get these permits are very coveted. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great experience. And so, and it's a coveted permit. And so people that get them put a lot of effort into actually going out and harvesting their goat. Um, and goats, by their nature, once you can get to a goat area, they're, 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 they're sitting there on a cliff. <laughs> so they're, you know, if they're in a place where you can actually sh harvest them and recover them, they're in a place where you can usually get them. The other thing about mountain goats is they don't tend to flee as much as other ungulates. Their predatory response is more to turn around and move towards the threat or stand there and stare at it. So it makes them easier to kill. So typically if someone gets a permit, we have a really high success rate. Are the permits to private individuals or after bag killing No, they're drawing permits yet, so it's it's any hundred percent for them. Mm -hmm. I've seen goats with collars. Is that data helpful? You've probably seen those in uh, near Logan Pass. Okay, I was gonna say in the park. <laughs> um, so the park is doing different research on mountain goats, and they have different projects going on. They're actually going to be putting out more collars. Um, but those are specific research projects. And yes, I'm sure they're helpful for the project that they're looking at. No, they aren't helpful necessarily for some of the questions we need to answer for our other herds outside the park. Yeah, uh, given the lack of data or survey information on these guys and the commitment that I think wild Montana have to wildlife, um, would this be a good opportunity to introduce some sort of citizen science campaign where you could actually have So the question is, would it help for citizens to help conduct surveys? The problem is, is the best way to do surveys for mountain goats is in a helicopter. And so we're not necessarily limited by manpower or, or wool manpower. Um, <laughs> I, I can sit in a helicopter I, and we not take anybody because it's, it, you want to be as light as you can. Um, so the, the problem with getting mountain goat surveys done is the weather, um, the availability of the helicopter, and the money. So we could have a big sale. <laughs> well, we've been doing it for a dozen years. I've been counting goats. It's already going on. In the, in the park, yes. In the park, they count. It. But it's a little bit different when we've got, in the park, there's access to mineral lakes, and that's where you've been doing the counts and stuff. I have another question. Mm -hmm. How compatible or competitive So the question is how competitive and how successfully competitive are they with bighorn sheep for food and are habitat? They are they compatible? Um, yeah, and we do see mountain goats and bighorn sheep overlap. I mean, that's one of the issues they have down in Yellowstone where they introduce mountain goats, and now the concern is they're actually out-competing sheep for habitat. Um, but you will see goats and sheep feeding side by side. In a lot of the areas where we have native herds outside of the park, we don't have bighorn sheep. Um, so there's not direct competition in this area, but in other areas, you'll see them more mainly even. Is there a chance that someone might develop a drone with a long enough range that you can do some of the surveying via drones? 
Yeah, the question is, is, is there a drone that might help? Um, and, you know, we talked about that in Alaska, because we do our sheep surveys with drones, and, I, you know, I, I'm not opposed, and I wouldn't say that there isn't some technology that might be able to aid, um, but then again, I don't know, like, I don't know what the, <coughs> the cost or, you know, and I think um, it's been explored, and it continues to be explored, <coughs> but I think it's pretty cost prohibitive at this time. Um, because it's not just the drone, it's <coughs> looking at everything else out of the, you know, the video footage and all of this stuff. And the, um, I think one of the big constraints <coughs> that is the amount, the distance, um, like, that it, that it will be away from the operator yeah. is the big restriction yeah. there. Mm -hmm. looking at goats' response, especially to um, helicopter activity and fixed wing activity. Um, there is two studies out of, of Canada that looked at um, four-wheeler use in vicinity, and they found that goats did not habituate to motorized use at all. And, and in fact, helicopter and that kind of activity is, is really disruptive um, for goats, especially during the winter when they're physiologically stressed. Um, Goats can habituate to human presence, and like you said, you, you see goats approaching, and, and it just, it, it's kind of variable um, in that sense, the, and it depends on the amount of disturbance and location. And the time of year, you know, um, some, like, nanny kid groups are more susceptible to disturbance than other, you know, than other groups. Um, so, but we do know that motorized use has a big, has a negative impact on goat distribution, and they will displace them from the area, and they don't tend to habituate. There's been no indication from the studies, and the studies are pretty limited, but there's been no indication that they do habituate to motorized use. Mm -hmm. Is there any problem with <laughs> applying for and getting a goat permit and not using it? Um, you know, we never try to encourage people to do that. Um, you know, we, with like trying to fill the spot of a go permit and not using it, um, that's a personal ethical decision that you can make. I, nobody could stop you from doing that, but we try to manage for putting those out for people that legitimately want to go and hunt and harvest a go. populations are different. Um, and so what's happened is they've taken goats and put them in novel habitats um, where they didn't exist before. And what we see in those goat populations is stuff that we don't see in native herds. We see very eruptive um, population growth, and we see younger goats being more successful breeders. Sometimes we see twinning. And the idea is that it's, it's a habitat thing. There's more habitat. It's novel, they can boom up to a certain level, but then they eventually plateau. But when they plateau has been very varied. Um, and it just kind of depends on the area where we're in. Like I said in Kodiak, we haven't seen that plateau yet. They just keep going and spreading because there's more available habitat. They've upped the bag limit to two goats per person if you get a permit, you know, and they cannot control them. Um, and, and we saw this in the crazies. They took off and now they've kind of leveled. And we saw this in, the, in Square View. They took her off, they leveled out, and then they dispersed. They went to the high towers. You mentioned they're ruining the habitat. Could you expand on that other thing? Oh, like, so in, in Kodiak, they've overbrowsed, overgrazed. You know, it's just like putting too many cattle in one spot. And, and so it's, it's not necessarily that they're ruining it, but they eat themselves out of house and home and move on, you know, and expand and expand and expand. And they compete with other native ungulates in some areas they can. And so, like, that's a concern in Yellowstone that they're competing with bighorn. That's the native population. Okay. All right. 
I want to thank everybody for coming tonight, and I especially want to thank Jesse and Northwest Montana Look Out Association has donated this beautiful mug with their beautiful logo on it, so she can drink coffee after she collapses. <laughs> We hope to see you next month, uh, February 22nd, to be 101 Days of Solitude by Amy Pearson.